Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this morning's study. We will be doing a bit of review over some of the things that we have covered in the last couple of days. So before we begin, shall we ask our Heavenly Father <clears throat> for his blessing as we open his word to understand the times in which we are now living. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come before you today to seek to learn of your word and to understand that which is written. We ask now, Father, for your guidance and your direction. Be with us, each one. Show us, Father, that which we need to know. Help us so that as we open your word, we might more clearly understand the times in which we live and that which you would have us to understand. We need your guidance now more than ever. May your angels attend us. May your spirit help enlighten our minds. Direct us now, for this we ask, and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, on Monday, I copied several things from Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation from 1897. Now, as we were discussing this, this is not the first time that this book had been published. The book, before it became a book, had been a series of Sabbath school studies. Now, as we were going through this, Smith has the statement that he makes on Daniel 12, 1, that a definite time is introduced in this verse, not a time revealed in names or figures which specify any particular year or month or day, but a time made definite by the occurrence of a certain event with which it stands connected. Right. So um, I know that I'm, I'm here in Australia. Hi, everyone. So hopefully, you know, hopefully this, you guys can hear me okay? Yep. Okay. So one of the things that he's going to be addressing and that you guys addressed is the timing of the way that the book is written. So he seems to take, or chapter 12, as sort of happening consecutively. Is that correct? Right. right. And he's also taking it in a in a very lineal mindset. We were addressing yeah, I mean, yeah. We were addressing the point that th this this book is not written in correct chronological order. Yeah. So my understanding, and, and as we had gone through this, is that you come come to the close of probation, and that's really just it. It's going to allude to other events, but it's not going to give you at, at this point. It's not going to give you what it's because you know, it already gave you in verse 40 to 45. So that's part of the problem that he has is his interpretation of who the king of the north and the king of the south is. Right. So he doesn't see the events there having anything to do with the Sunday law in verse 40 to 45. Yeah, so it'd be impossible for, for him to, to understand the rest of the chapter because he, he's made that mistake in verse 36 where he believes that France is introduced as the king of the north. Right. Yeah, so there, there's so many problems that he has here. You know, one, of course, that you guys dealt with was the, the time, times, and a half. So, of course, he's going to assume that that is the 1260 years of papal persecution. Right. So that's, um, that's going to be a problem. So I'm going to, I don't know how to do this here. I'm going to have to do this on the other computer. To, so right now we don't have great uh, internet here. So it's affecting my ability to uh, to work how I normally work. Uh, just uh, to comment yeah. on, I was recently came across a study uh, by a group that follows your Smith's view. And they were interpreting, interpreting uh, verse 45 as Turkey. Is going to yeah. enter into is going to enter into Jerusalem and make it their capital. Mm -hmm. So that's that's their interpretation of, of the um, between the seas and holy setting up its palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yeah, so they're um, going to interpret all of this literally now. Yes. Yeah. So that's what seven, that's what uh, on members of the the church some different are now teaching. So we, we have to expect Turkey to, in some or some way, invade Israel and set up their capital in Jerusalem. Yeah. So now Roy Allen Anderson. So that's the study from uh, yesterday. 
and no, I didn't see that video yet, so I, I've been pretty busy here. Is he in line with the, that more literal interpretation of these verses? He has he he took a position giving credence to a more literal application. There was a a portion of what we were addressing that I thought that both you and Stephen would find interesting. I'll pull this up here in just a second. Okay. Um, in chapter 19 of his book, he was addressing, and I'll, I'll read these paragraphs. Daniel's book closes with the mention of two prophetic periods, the 1290 days and the 1335 days. See Daniel 12, 11, and 12. The 1290 days or years might well have begun with the alliance of church and state under King Clovis of France in 508. So his point here seems to be a little ambivalent, a little unsure. From that important event, the period would then reach to the time of the end of 1798. The 1,335 days being an addition of 45 days or years could bring us to 1843 when the great advent awakening reached its height the next paragraph inasmuch as gabriel was commissioned to make daniel understand what would befall his people the jews in the latter days some have wondered if the 1335 prophetic days or years might refer to the hegira or the muslim era which was exactly 1,335 lunar years. The Hegira began with the flight of Muhammad in 622 and would thus end in 1917, a short time before World War I ended and the Ottoman Empire collapsed. The last coins minted for the old Turkish government bear the date 1917, and on the reverse side, in Arabic numerals, 1,335. Now, the point that, that we addressed that I had found also kind of odd in this, not just that he was approaching the 1335 as being fulfilled with a lunar calendar, but in this book that he had written called Unveiling Daniel and Revelation, these paragraphs are found on page 178 of that book. So we have, okay. we have the digits of the 187. Okay. So he's saying that the 1,335 years is going to be connected to Islam. Right. Okay. And he's, he's searching for a way to make that happen. Yeah, so he's using Islamic years. So on the calendar converter, if we go to that date, uh, he, it, it actually ends up bringing us to 1916. If we're using the Islamic calendar and we're going to the first day of the first month, right, rather than just counting 1,335 years from. So I'm not, you know, he obviously doesn't fully understand how the calendars work. Right. So he's just kind of counting years, Islamic years, right? So he's, he's, he's got that idea that it's Islamic years. That he might be counting from the date that uh, the Hijra actually occurs rather than, so it would be in 1917 if he's counting from the date that the flight occurs. But if you count from the start of the Islamic calendar, 1335 years, to the first day of the first month, it brings you to October 28th, 1916. So he's using Islamic years, which which is kind of cool that he, he chose to use Islamic years, the 1335 of AH. Are you guys hearing me okay? You broke up quite a bit. Okay, yeah, because it said my internet was unstable. Okay. Yeah, something I'd have to think about whether... Why we would even apply the 1330, you know, I mean, maybe there would be a way of applying it to Islam. But but why is he applying it to Islam? He's just saying other people have done this, correct? He was, he was making the application. I mean, this is the first time I've seen that application made. Yeah, me too. But that's the idea. But, but it doesn't really explain why we would just address Islam there. So part of what we see happening within the church right now over these verses of 
of Daniel chapter 11, and it started a few years ago. And, and I think it was somewhat in response, not necessarily directly, but indirectly to this movement. That is, there were people who, uh, conservative Adventists, they're going back to the pioneers, right? But then you have other people who are reacting to that. And so there's all of these different types of views where people are trying to bring Islam into, like, sometimes people want to have, well, Islam the king of the south. And then some people want to have Islam as the king of the north, right? So there, there's all kinds of confusion regarding these verses. So the main thing that I saw from what, because I didn't see the one from yesterday, but I saw this part of the study from, from uh, Monday, is that there's these literal application of these verses, and it creates all kinds of confusion. It allows you to almost do anything you want, so all these people are pushing for literal applications, but they interpret it all differently. And, okay. and the, main, the main thing they're trying to do, which Uriah Smith was trying to do uh, with his, was to fit it into current events. So right now with the war that we have in Israel, you know, people are trying to fit this in as if that's what it's talking about. It's talking about literal events uh, between Islam and uh, and Israel, as if that is what it's, it's it, to me. It's inexplicable that people can do that. Seventh Day Adventists can do that, but it's it's futurism. It's not historicism. It's not it, it's not the way that we understand uh, prophecy. So so go ahead. Okay, Ron. the point. When Smith is attempting to fix this as a definite time, mm-hmm. what is, for me, kind of strange, we know that this is going to be a definite event. We don't know when this time is going to occur, but we know that when it does occur, that the close of probation has occurred. Yeah, and I'm not sure why he tries to say it's a definite time. That, like As you pointed out, it's like, well, when we talk about definite time, we mean talking about setting a date. Right. That, and that's how Alan White would use definite time. So so I find that peculiar uh, unless he's trying to attach that to the beginning of the 2300 days, which doesn't make sense. Uh, he would have to attach that to the end of the, you know, so not the start of the investigative judgment is what I mean. You know, the beginning of the end of the 2300 days. So when we get to the Day of Atonement, that that's the definite time, October 22nd, 1844. But that that doesn't really make any sense. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's lots of little things here that, you know, that Uriah Smith is doing that has really opened up this can of worms for a lot of people who are trying to interpret this without without the understanding that Jeff brought to Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45. Now, we could say, well. Obviously, Lewis F. Weir notices the, some of the same problems, but but Jeff really nails it down in that this mixing of the literal and the the figurative. You really can't do that in the way that people are doing this. Right. So the question that I have, and I, I think you know people people who are are trying to follow what we're doing, it there's such a difference from how we have done things compared to how. Other people are doing things in in, in relation to uh, applying these things to the present. So we understand that the history in connection with these prophecies will be repeated. And so what we have done is we have gone through uh, chapter 11 and shown the historical application of these prophecies. Now, when we get to the prophecies that are now being fulfilled, that's where people would start to have the problem of, of, of making the application. Because normally in historical application, we have the events have already occurred. And so we, we can just see that they've occurred. We can, we can lay them out. We can say, here's what happened. And we can see that this is a figurative, right? We use the symbols and we can apply those to things that have occurred in the past. The problem starts to happen when we look at events that are now unfolding or events that are, are, have not yet unfolded. 
right? That's where we would have this problem. And, and what people will do then when they move to the events that are now unfolding or have not yet unfolded, they try to make a literal application. Does that seem like a fair assessment? I would say so. Okay. So the question then is, how do we know how to make these applications for things that are have still not occurred? What is the basis that we have to say, we, we have to continue as we have. We have to take these as symbols and not apply them literally. So l- let's even step back a little bit further. So when we looked at understanding understanding the foundation, right? So what was what was the title of that series? It was examining the foundation. And we were looking at the Millerite understanding of Daniel 11, you know, verse 36 onward. And we're going to have Alexander Keith as really being the commentator that's going to be used by Josiah Litch, right? So Josiah Litch is dependent to a large degree on Alexander Keith. That's correct. That's how we we understood it. And and they're going to then I'm trying to remember some of the details. So they're they're going to make these applications regarding the battles that are going on. So part of the problem that we would have here is we see that Josiah Litch is correct in regard to Revelation chapter 9, for the most part, right? He he applies that to Islam, the, the first and second woe as being Islam, and he connects it correctly to the periods of time of the 150 years and the 391 years and 15 days. So that is correct. And that's also, to some degree, it's in agreement with Alexander Keith, but Alexander Keith doesn't give the same timelines, but he has a similar idea, if I remember correctly. But Alexander Keith continues to see Islam also in Daniel, you know, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45, right? right? So he's going to see Turkey. And so Uriah Smith, and Josiah Litch, and, and some of the pioneers are going to take this view regarding uh, verse 36, that it's going to be France is going to be the power that's introduced. And then the king of the north and the king of the south, the king of the north then being Turkey, the king of the south, Egypt. And, and we have determined that that we can't apply those literal nations to the north and the south. And that's because it's after the cross. And more even more specifically, it's after 538. That is, the, the king of the north and the king of the south previously could be used but once you have the papacy arise it 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 uh it is is a counterfeit symbol of of the cross so just as with with the church we have before the cross literal after the cross spiritual the same thing would happen with uh these two desolating powers paganism and papalism we in a sense would look at paganism as a counterfeit of the literal earthly sanctuary and papalism is a counterfeit of the spiritual or heavenly sanctuary. Is that uh, are people hearing me okay? I'm just, I'm always worried that I'm being not understood because the You're internet going problem. Fine. Okay. So does that make sense to people that, that that's how we have, we have come to understand this? I would think so. Okay. So Uriah Smith doesn't have, he's, he's confused as far as the literal and spiritual. And that has that's really been the main problem that we're seeing with with other groups. And then once you're taking literal, well, then you're going to have to take the events as Uriah Smith did. He's looking at the events that are happening with, you know, the sick man of the East, you know, Turkey in his day. And he makes some predictions regarding what's going to happen. Now, you're looking at the 1897 Daniel and Revelation. Uh, when is the last time he edited it? Is that his, because he would have edited it at, uh, is that his first writing of it, 1897? No, it's not his first writing at all. Okay, yeah, because you said he, he did um, Sabbath school lessons on it? Correct, and I, I believe I have all of those saved on one of my external hard drives. Yeah, because I think this would be, a, to me, this is a really timely topic for what's happening. As Stephen says, you know, there's these groups and, and some of them are, you know, loosely offshoots of, of this movement. Sometimes they're offshoots of offshoots, but they're, 
you know, this call back to historic Adventism. I mean, that's going to go back to, you know, no, Jeff's. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, what um, what date was the first birth granny? What day was the first what, William? What was the first date of the birth granny? I'm looking right now. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I remember. Yes. Uh, um, yes. James White in 1877, I think, was contending with Uriah Smith. So it would have been before that time. Right. Yeah. So, so one of the things interesting about this is there is this, I mean, as we know, there are many conservative Adventists who see Ellen White's endorsement of Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith as, as almost giving it, it inspiration. So she recommends this book. It's God's Helping Hand, right? And that's interpreted as a wholesale endorsement of, of the book. And, and that's not, that's not really sensible because she, she, you know, endorses, for instance, uh, the Day Star article, which has all kinds of problems with it. Just because she endorses something doesn't mean she's, she's claiming infallibility for Uriah Smith. Okay. So you, you have there the dates of this, how this is laid out. What I'm looking at right now, when we go back to what I have in front of me is the Review and Herald from February 9th of 1869 was the okay. publishment of the lessons. So he was, he was doing this, it looks like, from 1868 through 1869 before this became a book. Okay. So we we're looking at almost 30 years from when he's, he's publishing those Sabbath school lessons to this edition of the book. Correct. Yeah. So you had mentioned before about 30 years that he's been studying this. Now, Uriah Smith, especially early on, he, he is approaching a lot of things from the point that he's supporting the pioneer understanding of things. And you can see this when he's going to address, you know, the beasts of revelation. Yeah. He's, he's basically going to be following what was done in the past, which is a good thing. The problem comes as time goes on. As time goes on, I think he departs. He, he becomes more and more dependent upon Protestant commentators and, you know, the lexicons and so forth. And there's nothing wrong with, with reading a Protestant commentator. And there's nothing wrong with looking up, you know, Hebrew, Greek word. But he, he puts more weight upon the, those than he's not using Miller's, Miller's rules as his primary way of studying. So in a way, what actually happens with the church that we see with the 1919 Bible conference and all that history afterwards is this really is going to start with people like Uriah Smith who, who want to be, I don't know if recognized is the right word, but they think that in order to convince other Christians of the truthfulness of our message, that we, we sort of step onto their ground. Uh, is that a fair assessment? Uh, very direct, yes. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem that, that we're having right now is that it's a problem that exists almost <laughs> everywhere. People don't understand why they believe what they believe. That is, they have come to believe certain things for reasons that seem to them to be reasonable, but they have never examined the foundation of those beliefs, where they come from. So a, a good example of this would be people who reject the 2520 based upon Edwin Thiel's chronology that totally contradicts God's word and the spirit of prophecy, you know, to say that Manasseh wasn't taken captive in 677 and not realizing that the chronology that they're using <clears throat> is a corrupted chronology. So it, it it's... um. It, it takes time to go back and figure figure out what the basic premises is, are that people have depended upon in order to start with their basic premise of, of how they've come to their conclusion. So working your way back to the source, that's that's what people don't do. They just believe things because it fits in with what they already believe or some it fits into some party spirit. It fits into something that they want to believe 
because they're they're part of a group that so you have people who are his, historic adventists and we're going to go back to the pioneers well one is uh, there are things that the pioneers were united upon but there are things that the pioneers were not united upon you can't really say that the pioneers were united upon the understanding of of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, or even back verse 36 to 45. There are different views and understandings. And just because, let's say, Josiah Litch writes about something, doesn't mean that everyone else agrees. So it's not it's not that easy just to say the pioneers, because the pioneers are not necessarily in, in every area giving a united front. That is, there's lots of things that they throw out there to look at and examine, that they, it wasn't really a part of their message directly. And yet people think that we, we have to go back to that. But we, when we examined the foundation, we saw the problems that they were having with trying to apply these verses to France, you know, the verses, you know, verse 36 to France and having this, this battle between France and, and Turkey and France and Egypt. So I think somehow we need to be able to, to go through through this, I mean, normally what we like to do is we like to understand the truth, right? So we study the truth and w- what it says. But there are times that people have have mixed in error and they don't fully understand why or how. And so we have to separate the precious from the vile. We, we have to do this type of work where we, we examine things that we know are not correct, because right? that's really what we did. You brought up Uriah Smith and you brought up Roy Allen Anderson and what they said. And we, the only way that we can we can look at those things, like if we were starting from that, we're saying, well, we're going to start with just what Uriah Smith says and we're going to accept that it's true. Or we're going to start with Roy Allen Anderson. And we don't understand the basic premises that that they're operating on. Then we can just go off in whatever direction they're going to take us. But we haven't done that. We, we've started with Miller's rules and with the scriptures and with the spirit of prophecy. And so we're going to have a much more solid foundation than a lot of these speculative sort of interpretations that especially are looking at the events that are happening today and trying to say these are the events that are actually being prophesied, you know, in, in the direct, direct way. Now, we do have... And I know I'm going on a bit here, but we do have this um, how we then. Yeah, we're going to look at that quote there. But what we have done is we have applied these two events, but only in a secondary sense. That is, we look at this historical application and we see that we re- repeating that history on the level having to do with this movement itself. And to some people that that would be futurism because they don't understand how we're doing this. Because some people want to apply, you know, events, you know, current events. But when we're doing it, we're we're doing it as as it unfolds within the movement after we pass over this this ground of fulfilled prophecy. It reflects back on past events, and those shine light forward into our path, which is what what we need. So we can we can see in these events of historical application, we can see that. There is a present truth application, but it's not a direct application. And we're not using, we're not confusing literal and spiritual. So, so in some way we need to make these things really clear for people. So uh, the quote, so Stephen posted that quote, the quote by Ellen White is used to endorse Smith's view. Sunday morning boats and trains poured their living freight upon the ground in thousands. Elder Smith spoke in the morning Upon the Eastern question, the subject was of special interest and the people listened with the most earnest attention. So is that all she says about it, um, Stephen? Yes. Okay. Now, there's a, right now at that time, I think it's 1877, and uh, James White, he's contending against Smith's view. And I think uh, Ellen White, she sort of rebukes James White over, I think it was more of his mind. Rather, it wasn't really so much the content of what he was saying, but just the way he went about arguing against well, Elder Smith in their time. Right. So, so people end up interpreting this as Ellen White is endorsing everything that Elder Smith says on the Eastern question, 
Now, the Eastern question, part of it is what does she mean by the Eastern question specifically? And I, I think that's part of the problem because the Eastern question is simply a reference to what's happening with Islam, right? Yes, because you had about their time Russia and Turkey involved in wars, and a lot of people were looking to this is like a fulfillment of prophecy in some way. Mm -hmm. that yeah. And um, so that was, it was a topic, a big topic at that time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so I, I don't see this as an endorsement of what Uriah Smith is saying regarding that. So one is the things that he predicted didn't actually occur, uh, that people were predicting. So they're, they're looking at current events, and, and in some ways this is kind of an aftermath of what has happened with Turkey on August 11th, 1840. This is how things begin to sort of unfold regarding the end of Islam, the end of the Second World. And this continues on basically until 1920, right? So finally, when the Sultanate ends in 1920 or 21, I always forget the date. It's November 1st anyway. So that was really part of the, the issue is, is first, what does she mean by the Eastern question? It's not so clear. Yeah, and that's going to be uh, just going to give you the year of that. It's actually going to be 1922. So that's uh, November 1st, 1922. It's the the eleventh day of the eighth month. No, that's not it. It's not 1922. Well, because this here uh, quote, I think it was originally in the Herald, 1877. That was the one you're talking about, the, the Elmite quote. Yeah. Okay. Where yeah, is this? Sixth, sixth of September, 1877. Okay. So September sixth, 1877. Well, that's kind of an interesting date. Okay, I, I don't have the date here for the, so, oh yeah, there it is. Yeah, so it is ne November 1st, 1922. It's going to be the 11th day of the 8th month. So it's going to be August 11th, right, as a symbol, the 8th month with the 11th day. So part of the problem that we have in this understanding that that Ellen White gives regarding August 11th, 1840, because definitely she sees it as the fulfillment of the prophecy that Josiah Litch was correct. So we have this understanding about what happened with Turkey. But then it's not going to unfold as time goes on the way that people expected the end of Turkey. So in a sense, they still are continuing looking for how that's all connected. And they're, they're seeing that this issue, which they're calling the Eastern question, is connected with the end time events. But it doesn't align with the spirit of prophecy. So the question is, why is Ellen White making this statement? Would we take this as an endorsement of what Elder Smith is presenting, that Uriah Smith is presenting? Very flimsy. What's that? What did you say? I think it's, it's very flimsy to base the whole argument. Yeah, it, it's pretty flimsy. Yeah, she's not saying that, you know, he's correct. She's just, he's speaking on the Eastern question, you know. I, I, I think there's another statement where, you know, maybe a little stronger than this one. I don't know. But, but. I've never seen anything where she's just endorsing what he's saying regarding that. Now, they would say, well, since she endorses the book, Daniel and Revelation, then she's endorsing what he's saying about uh, the Eastern question in that book. But, you know, Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith is very helpful for people who are going to study Daniel and Revelation. So it, to say it's God's helping hand doesn't mean that we, we have to accept everything that Uriah Smith says there. Then you refer to, so it's back going to be back in 1877 that, uh, that James White is going to be rebuked by Ellen White. Is it in particular to what he was presenting at this time or is it some other event? Can we connect it specifically to what she's referring to? Does he write an article that she rebukes or? No, I believe that it was a situation that Smith had given a presentation and then Elder White gave a presentation that was the antithesis of what Smith had presented. So he presented his understanding, but because they were so divergent, she went to him and, and stated that he, elders, you know, Elder White should not be publicly denigrating Smith. Okay. Now we, we have a, a little bit of a parallel in, in this movement. And so. Dealing with 
Samuel Snow's letters. So we're going to have this situation where uh, Tabo was presenting the idea that the prediction before midnight that we would use uh, Samuel Snow's May 2nd, 1844 letter as the date for the prediction before midnight or, or as the, in, in Millerite history. Then we're going to have Dwayne Dewey while Jeff is in Alberta. Dwayne Dewey's teaching at the School of the Prophets, and he's going to make some strong statements regarding what Tabo has been teaching regarding the prediction before midnight and suggest that July 18th public published letter is uh, the prediction before midnight in Millerite history. So Elder Jeff is going to hear about this, and then he's going to re- rebuke Dwayne Dewey publicly for making those statements about Tabo and even takes down the video that had been posted. And to me, there's, there's sort of a parallel. There's, there's a way to address differences. And, and one is to not just go public right at the, at the start. And we don't have what Ellen White says to James White, like on a personal level, we just have what she says. You know, we don't know what she said to her husband regarding this personally. But we would say that's generally not a good idea to present to the public this divided position when, when you're trying to present, when you're trying to win people to a message, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have this sort of heated difference. I don't know how else to express it, but that's good counsel that Alan White is giving, but it wouldn't be the endorsement. For instance, Jeff isn't endorsing Tabo's view when he rebukes Dwayne Dewey, right? Correct. Okay. So rebuking Dwayne Dewey doesn't endorse what Tabo was teaching. Rebuking James White doesn't endorse what Uriah Smith is teaching. But that's the way that people are taking it. Is is that make it clear, Stephen? Is that would you agree with that? Um or just say it again. So so just because James White is rebuked publicly publicly. It is not an endorsement of what Uriah Smith is saying. Just as when Jeff rebuked Dwayne Dewey, he wasn't endorsing um, Tabo, what Tabo was teaching. Right. Yes. So I, I don't know what I mean. I I think what you what you're doing, uh, Dwight, is really really good. I mean, look, looking at these things, I think yeah. is really timely. I'm just not sure how, how we're going to proceed. So one is I have this problem with my internet. I'm going to try to see if I can get somehow get see wh- wh- how this internet works here. Maybe there's a way I can get things sped up. I don't know. Okay, so Stephen has a quote there. One brother who had intimated in his writing on the subject of the King of the North might be the Pope told me that Sister White told him he should never have intimated any such thing and that his idea would only create confusion. This was not put in print, but it was what he told me in the autumn of 1878. Jane Loftborough, letter to Wilfred Bello, California, March 25th. Okay, so what what is the context of this here, Stephen? This quote, what is? Yeah, so this has been used as a sort of an endorsement. So uh, Loftborough has sort of like have a, a bit of hearsay. Yeah. So these, uh, this is like going back now, what, uh, over 30 years or whatever as well. 30, 40 yeah. years it was even more flimsy, you know, to, to um, put any weight in this. And um, yeah, so but this is what the straws they're, they're sort of grasping to try to yeah. you know, put credibility on uh, that Turkey's the King of the North. You know, this is where they're going to. Well, they have, they do quote um, yeah. Maskell and A.T. Jones and stuff, and they, they, they all kind of have that view. Well, and um, they're just sort of saying this was the bulk of the Adventist understanding at their that time. Other than maybe James Wright, there was very little said about who was the king of the North, um, opposed to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, so what they're doing is, as you're saying, they're they're sort of grasping at straws. So here we have something definitely would never be admissible in court. Now, because Ellen White, for instance, she definitely does more than intimate that Daniel 11 verse 36 is a reference to the papacy. I mean, she connects it to second Thessalonians chapter two, which is completely consistent with scripture. And 
you're not going to argue in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 that that power is France. Nobody has that position. So, Well, there was quite a few that take that few, maybe not initially. But I think there was, there was like a kind of mixed, not there, but um, I think uh, quite a few have eventually took the view that France was uh, the power there. With Second Thessalonians trying to make that France? Well, no, but the, well, Daniel 11 verse 36 is France. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand that. But nobody is going to then take the Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and say that that's France. But Ellen White puts the two together. She um, she has verses 30 to 36 as a block, as one subject. Yes, yeah, yeah. So verse 36, she doesn't introduce a new power, Ezra yes. Smith. Yeah. Oh, and she was, she shouldn't have... Uh, he says that history is going to be repeated, so she and she quotes thirty to thirty-six. Now yeah. all these other interpreters who have Turkey being the king of the north will say France is the power there. Verse thirty-six to thirty-nine is brought to view. Yeah, but it wouldn't really make sense for Ellen White to quote verse thirty-six along with group that in with verses thirty. You know, she should have just stopped short in verse 35. If that was going to be, if, there, if, verse, if verse 36 was going to be introducing another power. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, I, I just, I, I mean, James White's arguments uh, are very solid. We have each time that we're going through Daniel chapter two, Daniel chapter seven, we're always going to, to Daniel chapter eight, we're going to come up to the papacy. Right, that's going to be the power. To all of a sudden have Daniel chapter 11 coming up to, you know, France, you know, this this new power with the king of the north now, you know, being Turkey. So we have Islam now is is now they are both satanic powers, Islam and the papacy. They both come from the bottomless pit. But there's no way that you can you could take the line of prophecy and see the parallel by putting Islam in there. So this becomes, you know, this problem. And the reason why we're talking about this has to do with this 1335 that Roy Allen Anderson mentioned, which which I have to watch that study um, from from yesterday to go through that. But these these are the things that we have to we have to sort out because we would like to be able to help people who are are searching for truth and want to find the truth and who could be confused by these different voices regarding historic Adventism. So we have to contend for this faith that was once delivered to the saints. We have to decide how to sort through this because it, it is on the surface to say, well, we're going to accept what the pioneers say um, and we're not going to depart from that. That that becomes a bit problematic if you're not really understanding what, what they're presenting, but also the implications of what that says about what Ellen White has stated on on these things. So we know that there there is more light to come. New light never contradicts established truths. And so we have to be able to give a reason why we take the view that we do on these verses. And one of the things is that you create confusion when you mix the literal and the spiritual together. And, And this is where Jeff really started when it comes to Daniel chapter 11. He saw a presentation, as you know, he saw a presentation on Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45. He saw that the guy was presenting literal and spiritual mixed. And Jeff at the time didn't understand the verses themselves. But he knew that what was being done with these verses was not correct. And so he began his own personal study. And that is how this movement really started is from that study. Jeff had already understood the repeat of history, that we're in this time where history is going to be repeated, and that Millerite history in particular is going to be repeated. And so that that understanding about the repeat of history, it takes literal history, and it then repeats it, right? But when I say literal history, it doesn't mean literal in the sense that we take, we just interpreted the verses literally, we have to still understand the symbols. So this is the problem that, that people are going to be facing. This is going to be the main issue 
when people are looking at our studies. And uh, we understand it because we've, we've gone through all of these other studies. We've gone through Daniel chapter 11, and we can see how we how the historical application, in a sense, it's almost literal, right? We, we can some, sometimes people say that Daniel chapter 11 is the most literal uh, of, of Daniel's prophecies, as it's just describing this history in, in a, a very direct way. But we know that it changes from literal to spiritual that you can't have the king of the north be the literal king of the north, the the power that occupies that territory, that has to change. And to be, to be able to show that to people, like we have to have that first sorted out in our mind very clearly. And and I don't know, I don't know that, um, that we really have that clearly defined. And then, you know, we have to be able to present that to people so that they can see it. So, Stephen, what you're doing here by looking, by studying with these people and understanding it, I mean, first, we we have to look and examine what I believe is it true. But also it's it's to know how to help them work through this. Would you agree with me on that, that that's that that's part of the problem? How do we how do we communicate to people that that their interpretation of these verses is incorrect? Any thoughts on that, Stephen? Well, we can just. Yeah. Certainly get to know what they are, how they see things, and then just present. Obviously, uh, it's up to them. You know, uh, I presented some arguments, but there's just like it's like just rebound it. There's been no sort of leeway into uh, accepting another view as well. You know. Yeah. So you obviously people need to understand why what their view is. If you misrepresent somebody's view. As you know, like many people do when they attack something that they perceive to be error, they misrepresent the view, right? And that never is going to convince the person who holds that view because they'll know you're misrepresenting their view. Like when people try to argue with me by saying, I'm saying stuff I'm not saying, well, that definitely is not going to convince me that I'm incorrect. If they can understand what I'm saying, and they can go through and say, well, here is what you're saying, and here is why it's incorrect. And they have assessed what I've said correctly. And they can present a scriptural argument to show where I have gone wrong. Then I might be won over. Well, I should be if what they're presenting is the truth. But what I see happening often is that people just misrepresent something. So it's it's important to understand what people are actually saying if you're going to be able to show them where they have gone astray. And yeah. and that's not so easy to do to do. Yeah, so right? have you... yeah. Another quote in chat there. Uh, but this one here, I can't find it on the actual C D ROM. So I'm not too sure if it's unpublished. Yeah, so this one I've seen before. So the evening meeting was largely attended. Elder Smith spoke with great clearness, and many listened with opened eyes, ears, and mouths. The outsiders seemed to be intensely interested in the Eastern question. He closed with a very solemn address to those who had not been preparing for these great events in the near future. So this is in 1884, right? Is that... That's when he presented this. Now, we don't have what he actually presented, but they would take this as an endorsement. So since he spoke on the Eastern question and he closed with very solemn, this with a very solemn address to those who had not been preparing for these great events in the near future, they would say, well, the events that he predicted in the near future must be correct because she's endorsing it. Is that how people would take this quote? It does look a bit more convincing than the first one. Yeah, this is a quote I've seen before, right? So this is the one I know of. But we don't know what his his solemn address was and what what events particularly that she's referring to, because these could be events connected with the Sunday law that's coming, um, other types of things. Now, when you when you read Lewis F. Weir. And he addresses this this point. Have you looked, Stephen, at what Lewis F. Weir says all about Uriah Smith and what Uriah Smith was teaching? Have you read much of Weir on this point? I haven't. Okay. So you should. 
because he addresses this in all of these statements of, of what was going on at that time. He's going to address all of this. And he shows why you what prediction Uriah Smith makes and how those predictions failed. What's the name of that book by Weir? Well, there's a number of books. Let me see if I can let's see. I don't have my, my other computer, so. so. I can get that because probably do me good. Yeah, well, there's a few. There's one preparing for the close of probation. I, I should get all of these together. Weir's books are hard to get. Some of them were re re uh, published by what's the guy's name back in the 1980s and 90s by Harondell. Yeah, he he reprinted them and republished them, and so sometimes they're you know you can find them on the internet, find them on the internet or but you know you're not allowed to um, you're not allowed to use them. There's like copyright restrictions. So, you know, you, you can only find them like, uh, to buy. And, uh. Yeah, I'd so, want to buy one. I'd want to buy, yeah. buy one. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just saying we should go through Lewis F. Weir's books, at least some of them. And, and I think that's a good idea, especially on these, these points. Yeah. Those are yeah. the points. There. Just, because these are big issues. I mean, these are, these are things happening with, within Adventism, conservative, uh, ranks of Adventism. Been talk about it all the time. Fine. Okay, here I found these. Okay, now without my other, con- I'm, I'm going to have to t- dig these up because I did bring my one hard drive. So on that hard drive, I should have uh, all of my books in my my folder for books, but I don't have them here on this computer for some reason. I'm not sure why that folder isn't here. But yeah, so there's um, you know, he's going to deal with uh. You know, tidings out of the north and east. He's going to address that in a book. So he's going to go through this history of, of, of the conflict. What, what Stephen's sharing here, these quotes, he's going to go through these quotes. And uh, I think some of them anyway. What, what was going on at that time? I can't remember, you know, how much, whether he has this particular quote or not, whether that, what he had access to that at that time or not. So Dwight. Yep. So how how do you think we should approach this? You know, until I get my internet going, it's uh, it, it's not going to be easy for me to like share things on the screen and so forth. Now, were you done with Roy Allen Anderson's views and your I Smiths, or is there more you can look at with that? And you say you have some other materials to go through as well. I pulled up several other parties that had made publications of different things having to do with Daniel chapter 12. There was one that that I was going to go through. As we've been going through this today, I've I've gone back over some of the early publishing that that Smith had done about the book of Daniel. Okay. There there is a couple of more documents that I have already downloaded that I thought might be of interest because they would show some of the divergency of what's been going through the church right now. Yeah. Okay. So I think what would be good is we're trying to figure out how to approach, you know, this study. So I think, you know, you need to present some of these things that you've been doing. I need to watch the video and, and uh, from yesterday and finish watching them for Monday. And Stephen, so you've been studying this quite a bit. Ha, ha, are you putting together a document that you could even present? Okay. Yeah, I know because I know you've been spending a lot of time like talking with other people who have these divergent views, and 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 so have I. Now there are so many different groups. I'm not sure which groups you're dealing with. I'm trying to think of the name of the, the one group in particular that I've had to deal with, and. I mean, they believe that, you know, the eclipse, for instance, that we we had wasn't real. So, you know, they're very strange ideas, but they, they, they're they really extreme in, in accepting Uriah Smith, what Uriah Smith says. It's pretty much. And, and they say all kinds of contradictory things that they don't realize are contradictory. So who, what's the group you're dealing with that you're you're watching or discussing with? Do you know uh, how to describe there's a, a website called Seventh Day Press. 
and I think they're based in Canada. The presenter I was watching, he was originally from Bulgaria, but he's now living in Canada. So I think it's more around the Toronto, Ottawa type area. It's okay. Something. Do, do you know the names of any of the people? Uh, there is names I could probably try and find. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder if they were people who were in this movement for a little while from 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 that area, because there were some that were in this movement, or at least interested in it in that area, and then they they just disappeared. You know, they. Um, not that I more often have a look. Yeah. So, have you talked with any of these people, like personally, like discussions on? Okay, so so Dwight, you're going to continue for now. You're going to continue presenting material, like. And uh, that that's probably the best approach, I think, until I can see if I can get this internet sorted out. Okay, I can give you some names. Yeah. There's a pastor called Andy Whitehurst, and uh, there's a pastor, one from Bulgaria. There's a Vasco Belovsky, and yeah. Susan Everblast. Or all of these are just uh, contact team. Yeah. So this is not the same people that I. Okay. No. Yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna have to take a look at that. But if you can, uh, if you can get sort of do that, I'm gonna try to get the Louis F. Weir material together, and I think we should go through that. Now, Louis F. Weir, of course, has um, uh, the Certainty of the Three Angels Messages is one of his pretty important books. It's a very difficult book to get through. Uh, it's extremely concentrated, highly distilled study it's not like light reading he also has um another book which i always recommend and it's um what's it called can't think of the title there's certainly of the three angels messages and oh i can't think of the title of the other book i'll, I'll have to get some of these books together and uh, but we're going to have to go through some of that material so one is obviously he has a view of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. That's much more in line with what this movement is teaching. You know, we've looked at Swearingen and Swearingen, his, uh, you know, he has a similar view as well. But it's all these, these new views that are sort of claiming to be based upon the pioneers, and especially when they start getting Islam involved or what's happening with Israel, you know, that it's literal. Uh, that it has to refer to Jerusalem. You know, these become really problematic. And, and I, don't, I don't think a lot of people really even have, it, it makes sense to people, right? So you present something that's happening in the news and you say, well, the Bible is talking about this. And for many people, that's, that's all they need, right? They, have, they don't have the background. They haven't studied the pioneer's writings really. And, and there'll be somebody studying the pioneer's writings who tell, who's telling them that this is what the pioneers teach but they're not getting the whole picture. So I find it sometimes it's extremely difficult having discussions with people who just accept Uriah Smith as inspired in some way, at least his book inspired. Uh, the book, uh, The King of the North of Jerusalem, is that the one you mean? Yeah, yeah. That's one of the Lewis F. Weir's book. Yeah. He, he does quite a few different ones, but The King of the North in Jerusalem, that's, that's going to deal with this directly. Now, I, do do I have that? I'm trying to think which ones I posted on on my academia site. I, I probably should put all of his books there, but I'll try to get those together this morning before I go working in the field. So, anyway, Dwight, any other thoughts before we close? Um, can you can you give some thoughts about what you're going to do tomorrow? Well, yeah. Well, I'm going to have I'll have a couple more documents for us to consider, and we'll be looking at the positions that some others currently are accepting within the church in comparison to what, what we have been looking at within this with the movement. Okay. Yeah. This is so strange being here in Australia because, you know, it's Thursday here. That's a, right. And you guys, it's just Wednesday morning there, right? Where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean it's I mean it's early Thursday. It's it's uh, yeah, so it's one in the morning here. But uh okay. So so I think we can we can make this work. 
while I'm here, even if I don't have great internet. So we move away from the document we were working on, which I think is pretty much completed What because we got to the end of chapter 12 of Daniel, right? Um, there are things that I'm going to have to come back to. So what I'm going to be doing is, um, you know, we'll be having these studies. So for me, I, I, I'm just telling people what my life is right now. It is I go to bed about five o'clock in the evening. Um, then I wake up at 11 p.m. to go online to do this study. And so once we close here, I'm going to continue working on the Daniel 11 document. So writing it into a paper and, um, and then, uh, um, you know, maybe get a nap and so forth. And then I'll be working in the field, working on this serrated tussock, uprooting all, all the plants. So I've gone over the field, looked at what I have to do. Yeah. So we see how, how this goes. So just to let people know. So with these studies, we're going to move to, uh, uh, Dwight presenting. Maybe Stephen will present some of these as we go through for this next uh, six weeks. This is you know, five and a half weeks and see what we can get done in reviewing some of this material. But I think this will be important because we've gone through, we've gone through Daniel chapter 11. We understand it, but it's how do we get, how do we communicate to this to other people who have differing views? So that's going to be the, the issue. Okay. Dwight, you want to close with prayer? Certainly. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together so that we may examine other views, may examine that which we have been studying to see how this relates to what we are seeing at this time. We ask, Father, for your blessing and your guidance. Be with us, each one. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to do so that your character may be more properly represented with all with whom we come in contact. We thank you, Father, for this time and ask now for your guidance through this day. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.